Hello everyone, my name is um, Dr. Lai Heng Fong and um, I'm lecturing from Sydney, Australia. I'm one of the emergency physicians working here and uh, I also have um, some public health um, and disaster training and um, today I'm really honoured to speak to you about climate change and human health. Just a bit of a disclosure, um, I am the Chair of the Public Health and Disaster Committee of the Australasian College for Emergency Medicine and also Chair of the Public and Environmental Health Special Interest Group for the International Federation of Emergency Medicine. But all the views expressed here are of my own and not um, related to ASEM, IFEM or My Health or Educational Organisation. The objectives of the talk today would be to learn about the health impacts of climate change and uh, hopefully cover also some basic communication strategies about climate change and health and uh, talk a little bit about how to become a more effective climate advocate. I just wanted to start off um, my talk by saying that we are in the midst of a climate emergency and as emergency physicians, we understand that and we also know that we need to act now collectively. This is a WHO um, infographic, just uh, demonstrating how climate change has impacted um, on health risk of the world's population, as well as also affecting the health outcomes of the patients that we see. As we can see here, um, climate change increases um, climate uh, related hazards such as extreme weather events, heat, it's causing sea level rise, for, which increases um, the risk of flooding. Um, it also has other impacts on healthcare organisations where we work in terms of health workforce, the infrastructure, energy systems, water systems, just to name a few. In terms of health outcome, I'll expand in my talk a little bit later about how aspects of climate change related health impacts can cause increased morbidity and mortality in our patients. Because this is such a big topic, I'm going to try to con concentrate during my talk on uh, a few aspects of uh, the health impacts of climate change. I'll talk about air pollution, heat waves, mental health impacts of um, climate change and also about the power of health professionals as climate advocates. Air pollution is the silent killer in our globalized world. It affects, it kills 7 million people in around the world but it certainly affects certain areas more than others um, and uh, we call it the silent killer because often um, we don't know that our patients have died from the impacts of air pollution. So I would like to highlight this issue by talking about Ella. So Ella Kisi Debra um, was a nine-year-old girl who lived 95, uh, sorry, 25 meters from one of London's busiest thoroughfares. And she is significant because um, hers was the first case of death where air pollution was included in a cause of death. But as we know, there are many more, but um, she broke records um, in the UK because um, the cause of death for her was put down as excessive air pollution. Around 49% of the world's population, or about 3.8 billion people, are exposed to household air pollution from the burning of solid fuels for cooking. It's also a risk factor for many of the leading causes of death worldwide, including heart diseases, stroke, respiratory conditions, and diabetes. Every day we are exposed to air pollution, so it's not just in our homes, when we travel to work, when we exercise out in the open, it's everywhere. We also know that exposure 
to find particulate matter in outdoor air, called the PM2.5, is the fifth leading risk factors for death worldwide. As we can see from this um, world map, um, the um, different colours um, demonstrate the um, ambient particulate matter pollution in different parts of the world. And uh, the darker it is, um, the higher the uh, density of particulate matter pollution. And as we can see, um, the darkest blue is concentrated on um, parts of Asia as well as parts of Africa. Whereas where I'm from in Australia, it's um, relatively low exposure. So what do we know about health impacts from um, PM 2.5 and PM 10? So PM stands for particulate matter and uh, the two different ones um, refers to its size um, and it has different health um, effects. So the coarser particles, so the PM 10, uh, deposits in the upper airways, whereas the smaller ones called the PM 2.5 actually can travel much further down um, into um, the deep parts of the lungs. And what does it cause? So we know that um, coarse PM can be mostly eliminated by mucociliary clearance and it's in the upper airway, whereas fine PM will invade deeper into the lungs and are capable of translocation to distal organs. We know that um, th there's been increased rates of culture negative pneumonia and um, influenza um, due to increased fine particulate matter. And that's the, um, the seminal study uh, that's been published by the Annals of the American Thoracic Society looking at that link. We also know that air pollution can worsen asthma and uh, Australia has one of the highest um, prevalence of people with asthma. And uh, certainly we saw in the bushfires of 2019-2020 that um, there were um, a 30% increase of presentations to the ED from asthma and other respiratory conditions. So studies have shown that short-term exposure to PM2.5, ozone and um, NO2 were associated with a lower FEV1 and FEC in non-smoking adults. And the long-term um, exposure to PM10 and NO2 decreased lung function parameters such as the FEV1 and FVC. In terms of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, we know that uh, just a small increase in um, PM10 in outdoor air can induce significant acute exacerbations um, of COPD and uh, lead to mortality in this group. We also know that 8% um, of global COPD deaths were attributed to air pollution in 2012, according to WHO data. So this was my city, Sydney, in, um, at the height of the 2019-2020 bushfires. And uh, I show this because this is the time where I actually became a climate advocate because I realized that climate change induced impacts to the environment is here to stay and is only getting worse. And I felt that um, our patients um, didn't really fully appreciate the impacts. And I felt that as a healthcare professional, it was my duty to um, increase awareness of this problem and um, do something to change this. This is a photo more recently in New York City during um, the Canadian bushfires. And it certainly, no bushfires, no, no international borders. Um, and uh, it caused this scene in the middle of New York City. And this was taken, this was a photo taken by a friend of mine, a Canadian friend who happened to be in New York City at that time. So um, moving on to air pollution and lung carcinoma. 
we know that um, air pollution um, contain several mutagens and carcinogens, um, including those um, listed on um, my uh, PowerPoint slide. Um, and there is definitely a higher um, incidence of lung carcinoma um, to people exposed to high levels of air pollution. Next, we want to talk about air pollution and cardiovascular diseases. Um, we know that um, air pollution um, increases the risk of acute myocardial infarction, um, and uh, they do so by three main mechanisms, which is um, through inflammation uh, by the inflammatory mediators. Um, they cause autonomic imbalance, um, and they also cause um, direct blood translocation, um, which can cause damage to the blood, the blood vessels, um, and to our hemodynamics. Air pollution and cardiovascular diseases are related in that acute exposure to PM2.5 are known to cause death due to um, cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. So there are two specific um, elements in air pollution, um, such as NO2 and PM2.5, that increases the risk of uh, myocardial infarction. There's also increased risk of heart failure and arrhythmias. Um, and uh, we have seen an association um, of uh, cardiac arrests that's increased 8 to 18% for every increase um, of 10.5 micrograms per meter square in PM 2.5. So we also know that uh, increased P PM 2.5 levels causes increase in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. In terms of air pollution and CNS disorders, um, there's been more and more studies that have shown that uh, both short-term and long-term exposure increases the risk of stroke. Specifically for ischemic stroke, both short-term and long-term exposure can increase the risk, whereas in hemorrhagic strokes, we have seen short-term exposure of exposure increasing the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. There's also been some recent study that shows that um, air pollution um, can increase the risk of dementia. In terms of um, air pollution and its link to um, maternal um, adverse impacts, we know that um, it causes um, well, PM10 and PM2.5 um, and NO2 are consistently related to head growth restriction. And maternal exposure to uh, air pollution has been linked to poorer birth outcomes, such as preterm births, low birth weight, stillbirth, or spontaneous abortion. Early childhood exposure has also been linked to um, risk of asthma, um, adverse effects on lung development, childhood leukemia, obesity, attention disorders, and autism. Moving on to air pollution and diabetes and renal disease, um, we know that uh, exposure to sulfur dioxide and PM10 can lead to increased risk of type 2 diabetes, whereas PM2.5 um, exposure can lead to membrane nephropathy, decline in renal function, and increased end-stage renal disease. Moving on to health-related illnesses, um, over the past 100 years, heat waves have caused more deaths than any other natural hazard in Australia. We know that Australia has always been hot in summer, um, and I think um, that's why people have just expected that in the summer it's going to be hot. But um, many of them don't realise that with climate change, the summers are getting hotter and it lasts for longer periods. And... Um, Heat waves have widespread effects ranging from direct impacts on our health um, to damage to ecosystems, agriculture and health infrastructure. Heat also has global impacts um, and we know that the lowest income countries um, own, well, produce one tenth of the emissions but are the most heavily impacted um, by um, climate change and uh, heat waves is no difference. So there are a lot of places now in Asia that are 
uninhabitable due to the increased heat. Global temperatures have increased, um, especially in the last 20 years, and we know that 2023 was the hottest year on record. So heat waves can exacerbate droughts and wildfires and also make air pollution worse. So it has kind of a catalytic um, impact um, on disasters. So it is predicted that by 2050, more than 200 million climate refugees would be displaced from um, six main regions, with the top three being sub-Saharan Africa, um, Asia and South um, parts of um, um, Asia and the Pacific and also South Asia. So here are some statistics um, that um, the Climate Council in Australia have, um, um, have put up in their website. Um, as we've um, heard before, the biggest killer among natural disasters in Australia is heat. And uh, Victor in the Victorian heat wave in 2014, we know that there were more than 200 heat-related deaths that were reported, um, and significantly, 24 increase in ambulance call-out, um, and a fourfold increase in calls to nurses on call, um, and also to doctors. This means that... Uh, these healthcare providers actually cannot get to other emergencies such as stroke or um, myocardial infarction that are time critical. We also know that the increase in hot weather observed um, in the 2000 to 2009 decade has already reached the best estimate projected for 2030. This means Earth is warming at a higher rate than we anticipated, and that's why we need to act. So um, in terms of heat effects on health, um, we have the direct um, impacts um, such as um, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and more, most worryingly, um, heat stroke. Um, but we know that heat also worsens other chronic medical conditions, such as um, cardiovascular and respiratory conditions. Um, but there are also indirect impacts of heat, um, which um, is on um, transmission of diseases, um, on health infrastructure, and on our air quality, and also um, on energy transport and our water supply. Uh, this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to show what um, are the direct impacts and indirect impacts of heat and what are the um, follow-on effects um, from um, extreme heat. So the most vulnerable people to heat are um, older adults, um, people with comorbidities, people on medications, and many people who are marginalised, such as poor people, people who are socially isolated or disabled, and people who are working in the heat, and in Australia, also First Nations people. These are the um, list of health-related uh, complications of heat, and um, they are in the broad categories of heat cramps, heat syncope, heat exhaustion, um, and the worst of them, which is heat stroke, um, which is a medical emergency. And uh, this is um, uh, something that was um, put out by the, um, one of the state governments in Australia just to recognise that, you know, in terms of um, symptoms for heat strokes, if um, one of your family members are exhibiting those symptoms, especially if they are confused and disorientated and uh, their body temperature is more than 40 degrees, we have to call the ambulance immediately. I just wanted to show a quick slide about um, drugs that are known um, to um, put people at risk um, for heat-related complications. Um, this is because they affect um, the cardiovascular and renal physiology, um, and uh, they can actually make um, heat illness worse. 
So in terms of the heat waves, we really need to be prepared. Uh, we have to have a whole of society response, not just a healthcare organization response. Um, that would involve um, also training the community um, in the um, signs and symptoms of um, critical illnesses due to heat and also um, to modify the behavior so that um, they are um, more heat safe. Um, and I would say that we also need additional training of emergency doctors um, because not many of them um, are um, up to speed with um, what um, heat can cause. Um, so these are just some references. I'll be sending um, a whole reference list for my whole presentation um, later. So um, don't worry, you don't have to, um, you know, um, take this down. So um, I want to next move on to talking about mental health impacts of climate change. We know now from um, more recent studies that um, uh, climate change um, can worsen anxiety and depression. Um, and uh, there's even been a, a term uh, coined by a mental health professionals called nostalgia um, to describe mental health impacts of climate change. We also know that um, climate change induced disasters uh, such as flooding and prolonged droughts um, can also worsen anxiety and depression. Um, and um, extreme weather events, especially heat, have been associated with increase in aggressive behavior and uh, it increases um, substance misuse and um, the incidence of domestic violence. So um, this is um, a bit of a busy slide, but uh, I just wanted to know, wanted to demonstrate how different social and behavioral factors and climate drivers can impact on our mental health and well-being. So this is a study that's um, done by um, a psychiatrist, um, Sibel Day and her colleagues, looking at uh, rising temperatures and suicidal behavior in children and adolescents, published in Australian New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. Um, and uh, their study basically um, shows that um, uh, youth self-harm and suicidal ideation presentations to hospitals increasing in my state of New South Wales. Um, and uh, it's not otherwise um, explained aside from the increase in um, heat, uh, extreme heat days. Um, so recognizing this um, provides a potential preventable risk factor um, to decrease youth mental health outcomes such as um, suicides and self-harm behavior. This is the WHO, um, oh, actually, sorry, um, this is a um, US um, based infographic that shows the effect of climate change and mental and community health. And uh, we can certainly um, see that uh, climate impacts such as air pollution, bushfires, um, he extreme heat, water scarcity and droughts can um, make um, stress, anxiety, depression worse. Um, and there's also feeling of loss after disaster especially. Um, and uh, it can also lead to substance abuse. Um, and uh, we know that uh, it also has impacts on the community in increase in social instability and also increased violence and crime and, um, as I mentioned before, domestic violence. I just wanted to highlight that climate change really is um, a health equity issue in that the people who will be affected the most um, by climate-induced health impacts contributes the least um, to climate change. So how do we ensure that no one is left behind in, um, in the environmental degradation that we are witnessing today? We need to include them um, in uh, planning for um, any mitigation and adaptation strategies. We also need to specifically focus on some vulnerable, vulnerable groups that I've mentioned um, earlier in my talk. Um, essentially, um, if we want to mitigate and adapt to climate change, we need to design programs where all individuals have the opportunity to live in a safe space where they can thrive and live to their fullest potential. 
And these are the vulnerable population we really need um, to target. This is not exhaustive, but um, it certainly um, shows who are the people that we really must focus on. So how do we make a difference in this climate emergency? I wanted to spend the last part of my talk just talking about how you can make the difference um, because um, it can sometimes get a bit overwhelming thinking about what the future is going to bring um, with um, all the negative health impacts um, from the climate and also you know, the media cycle that only focuses on the negative. There's actually a lot that we as uh, healthcare providers can do, and certainly um, that has guided my work for the last uh, few years. Um, so um, what can you do immediately? So definitely um, ed awareness um, raising uh, and education is a big thing that you as healthcare providers can do, and that's why it's really important uh, for medical schools and even uh, professional colleges to have a module specifically on climate change and health. Um, in terms of your personal life, you can certainly make sustainable choices um, such as um, um, electrification of your home, taking public transport, um, walking uh, instead of driving to places, and also putting your money um, where it will not be um, going to funding fossil fuel companies. Um, and uh, as healthcare providers, um, we are actually a trusted member of our society, and that includes politicians. So um, I would um, encourage you to write letters to politicians, whether it's state or federal, and also to, um, to meet with them um, to talk about why it's really important to act now. Um, and uh, don't do it alone. You can actually, you know, um, increase um, your impact by working together with like-minded people. In terms of um, individual, um, with electrification, um, I've certainly gone through the journey in the last um, few years um, it, in um, changing the electric supply to my house um, to only renewable sources. Um, being careful um, in reducing food waste um, and uh, actually talking about environmental sustainability to um, not only um, to doctors but also to um, other health professionals and also to um, school children um, through um, organisations that I'm a member of such as the Doctors for the Environment Australia and also my college um, for emergency medicine um, I've done a lot of advocacy work, um, whether it be writing a submission for a parliamentary inquiry um, or talking to the media um, and also talking to communities. Um, and there's been a lot more um, articles um, and uh, peer-reviewed um, articles um, published on um, the different the link between climate change and health and how to mitigate and adapt to it. Um, I've also gone to... Um, Canberra to uh, that's our capital to lobby politicians um, and uh, I've developed a building community resilience in disaster toolkit as well so this is me um, speaking in Parliament House in Canberra um, as part of the Doctors for the Environment Australia contingent um, where we try to lobby the federal government to stop um, the Betaloo Basin fracking uh, project and also the Middle Arm uh, precinct in Northern Territory. We had a really great show of, um, these are all volunteers from different specialties um, in medicine who all came together to basically um, support this campaign. And uh, I won't go through all of um, these um, things, but, um, and I'll definitely be sharing my PowerPoint organized, um, presentation. So these are all the different things that I've done professionally through my college, um, through DEA, and also through the International Federation for Emergency Medicine. So um, I'm very proud of um, the my college for emergency medicine because we were the first professional college to declare climate emergency in uh, 2019. Um, and uh, we, um, we did this after we had um, 
uh, done a street protest um, talking about um, the climate emergency and uh, the urgency to act. So this is the next um, uh, phase um, in our um, advocacy. We've um, set up a sustainable emergency medicine and climate advocacy network to join people who are passionate about sustainability in the emergency department together across Australia and New Zealand. So in terms of community, there are lots of other projects that you can be involved in. And um, what I'm really proud about last year, um, I developed this um, Building Community Resilience in Disaster Toolkit, and I uh, was honoured to roll it out in the multicultural communities in Southwest Sydney, where I work. So this was uh, the um, um, first um, time that um, I did the presentation to all the community leaders and uh, it was really well received and uh, they've since um, brought um, another um, education package to their community um, members. Very exciting. Um, so in terms of communication um, strategy, it's really important that you learn how to frame um, the the climate emergency um, in that you know we should um, a call to action would be um, to um, create safety in communities and also um, job creation um, and uh, we need to know what really motivate different groups of people we're talking to whether it be politicians or community we have a to have a different pitch when we talk to them so um, these are the top 10 tips I can give in communicating climate change. Um, so the next time you are interviewed by um, a reporter, um, you can uh, take these 10 top tips um, with you um, and become a more effective uh, climate advocate. So what are the take home messages? We are in the midst of a climate emergency and the choices that we make this decade will largely determine um, how our future will be um, and um, the adverse health impacts, the degree of it will also be determined by what we do now and what we um, get our politicians um, to do um, at this time. So it's really important that everyone just jump on board and be involved um, in creating the world that we want to leave for our children and their children. Um, this is the critical decade to act and uh, we can make a difference collectively. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please write to me and uh, I'll be happy to um, answer all of them and uh, be um, connected to you um, through um, a common goal, which is um, to um, mitigate and adapt to the effects of climate change and uh, create a society where we can all thrive. Thank you.